All right, so we're going to talk about GI. The GI chapter is very long, so we're going to go through the PowerPoint fairly quickly, and then we'll hit the chapter, and I'll um, highlight the hot points for you. Um, in kids, the mouth is really vascular, and it is an entry point of infection. Um, you'll see lots of um, hand, foot, and mouth type illnesses in kids, um, usually caused by viral things, but everything goes in the mouth. Uh, the esophagus not fully de developed until about age one, therefore reflux is an issue. Um, a newborn can only hold about 10 to 20 mils, okay? About an ounce, okay? So make sure that your feeding instructions are pretty clear to parents. <coughs> um, intestines still not mature at birth. That affects a lot of <coughs> medication and, um, absorption. Biliary system. Um, Liver is pretty big at birth. You know, newborns have a kind of a big belly. Pancreatic enzymes come after birth. They develop after birth and really not getting to that adult level until about two. And then fluid balance. Kids get dehydrated a lot quicker than adults. And they're, they have a lot more body water than adults. So remember that point when you're, when you're looking at dehydration. All right, when you're assessing the GI system, you do it a little bit differently. Um, you're going to inspect first, and then you listen, and then you percuss, and then you palpate. Because when you start to palpate, you're going to ramp things up in there. So um, you always want to listen before you palpate. All right, some common treatments that you'll see with the GI system. Um, hydration either oral hydration, which we like to stick with in kids as long as we can because we don't like to poke and prod on them. Um, but if their dehydration gets gets severe enough, then they have to get IV fluids. Um, adequate nutrition, whether it be oral, whether it be um, IV like TPN or whether it be via G button. Um, enemas, lovely enemas. We do give enemas in kids for constipation. Uh, we try not to do it too often, um, but we do. Um, bowel preps like, oh, I don't know, for an upper GI or, you know, the CTs with contrast, sometimes those uh, require a little prep. Ostomies, you will see ostomies usually in the Crohn's and the ulcerative colitis patients. Um, so you may see ostomies. Probiotics, we, you know, these are recommended a lot, especially for um, kids that have gastro or, um, you know, chronic stomach issues. There's some really expensive probiotics out there now. I didn't realize it, but there's one that costs about $100 a month, and it's a prescription probiotic, and it's supposed to be, like, the best thing since sliced bread. So, and then you'll see, we'll talk about medications that we use in the GI system. All right, some labs that you'll see. Um, ultrasound, looking for appendicitis, uh, looking for masses, looking for ovarian, cyst. Um, you'll see ultrasounds done on the belly. Barium swallow, looking for structural, you know, difference or structural issues. Um, lab work, yeah, you're going to see lab work. You're going to see if you have a kid that you suspect that might be dehydrated, you're going to get electrolytes. If you have a kid that you suspect might have pancreatitis, You'll see amylase and lipase drawn a lot. Um, pH probe, not too often. Endoscopies, not too often. Hemocult, if you have a chronic kid or a kid with chronic diarrhea that has blood in it, that mom reports have has blood in it, then you may have to do a hemocult. Um, those are the big ones. And of course, like an x-ray, um, looking for constipation. They do a KUB kidneys, I think the U is like ureters, bladder, you know, all the way from there, the kidneys to the ureters and bladder, or the ureter, ureters and bladder. So KUB, that's what that stands for. All right, so if you have a child with some chronic diarrhea, you might be asked to get a stool specimen. And um, if they're in a diaper, you just scrape it out with a tongue blade, put it in, this, in the correct collection container because different tests test for different things, different containers. So make sure that you um, 
have the right medium when you go to send your lab work away. Um, if it's an older child, then you can use a hat that fits in the toilet and you can get the specimen from that. Okay. Uh, if it's a culture, you can actually use a culture swab and swab the rectum. Um, so that's a way you can do it as well if you need a culture. All right, talked about meds to manage some GI disorders. Um, your proton pump inhibitors and your H2 blockers like protonics, um, those you may see used a lot. Um, antibiotics, you may see it like in Crohn's disease. Sometimes they use some antibiotics. If you are diagnosed with H. pylori, then they use some antibiotics. Steroids, immunosuppressants, and Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, you'll see that used a lot. Stimulants, laxatives, uh, we try to stay away from laxatives in kids. We use more like the Miralax, um, I guess it's classified, it's kind of in the same category, but um, a stool softener. Antidiarrheals, now that's very controversial um, because if your body's trying to get rid of something, that's how they try to get rid of it. And so you won't see a lot of like Lamotil in kids. Um, Antiemetics, however, you will see a lot of. Zofran is the drug of choice at this point. They used to use Finergan a lot, but Finergan has some pretty funky side effects, so you're going to see more Zofran. Um, that's the big ones that you'll see. All right, some risk factors for GI disorders. Prematurity, um, you know, nothing is, if you have a preemie baby, there's, there's lots of, um, opportunities for things to go wrong. So that is always a risk factor. Family history, that's a big player. And um, if you're taking a history, make sure that you get a good family history. So you know if something has happened, you know, back a generation, then you can investigate that. Genetic syndromes, there's always, like with cleft lip and cleft palate, a lot of times those have some sort of genetic um, connection. Chronic illness, uh, prenatal factors, you know, what was mom exposed to prior to knowing she was pregnant. Um, so prenatal factors might be important. Uh, immune deficiency, chronic steroid use, foreign travel, you know, the whole Ebola thing um, and the whole what kind of weird diarrhea are we going to pick up. So um, good questions to ask when you're getting a history or a triage. Some acute dis GI disorders that we're going to talk about, dehydration, Vomiting and diarrhea, I kind of lump those together in a gastroenteritis type situation. Um, oral thrush, oral lesions, we're going to talk about those. And pyloric stenosis, that is um, not real common, but you will see some pyloric stenosis. Uh, it happens about a month of age. Males are more um, at risk than females. And... We'll talk about exactly what it looks like at presentation. Um, neck, necrotizing endocolitis, that happens a lot with the preemies. Um, intussusception, um, intussusception is very distinct in its assessment findings, and we'll talk about what would raise a red flag to make you think about intussusception. Malrotation and volvulus, you, do, you usually don't see those very very often, so we probably won't touch on those. Appendicitis, you'll see a lot of appendicitis. Uh, right lower quadrant pain, they have the um, appy shuffle, um, so we'll talk about appendicitis extensively. All right, some risk factors for dehydration. These are probably pretty common sense, but diarrhea, of course, vomiting, of course, um, decreased PO intake, yeah. Um, fever, fever leads to insensible fluid losses, so with a fever, you can be at risk for dehydration. DKA, definitely. And then extensive burns, we talked about in the skin section, um, it puts them at risk for dehydration as well. So how do you fix their dehydration? Um, oral rehydration solution, if at all possible. Stay away from, it says undiluted fruit juice, but if you have a diarrhea situation, you don't want to give fruit juice because it um, it can increase the diarrhea. Anything sugary can increase that. Oh, huh, never mind. Read the question, right? Um, fruit juice 
is a no-no. Milk, stay away from that. Um, so oral rehydration needs to be clear, Pedialyte, Gatorade, there you go. Children with mild to moderate dehydration, and we're going to go over what is mild, what is moderate. Um, they get bumped up on their um, little fluid rehydration um, formula. So they need about 50 to 100 mils per kilo um, over four hours. And then you reevaluate after every intervention, um, and if they can still continue to take PO fluids, you continue the PO fluids. If they fail their PO challenge, that's what we call it, um, then they may end up with an IV. All right, intussusception. Um, now, in intussusception, here's some risk factors, okay? Um, intussusception oops, presents with kind of chronic, or not chronic, but um, colicky, that was the word I was looking for, belly pain. And it's kind of, they have pain, and then they're fine. And then they cry in pain, and then they're fine. It kind of comes and goes, okay? And what an intussusception is, is the intestine kind of telescopes over itself, and that's where it hurts. So the telescopes over itself, and then it comes back to where it's normal position. So when it's doing that telescoping, kind of one end moving inside part of the other, kind of folding over on itself, that's when they have the pain. So these kids will be screaming, crying, and then they'll be fine. And they'll scream and cry, and then they'll be fine. Um, also, something you see with intussusception is a, a particular kind of stool that they call current jelly stool. And what that is is just stool with like some um, gel-like blood in it. Okay? Very distinct assessment findings with intussusception. Okay? <clears throat> Some structural anomalies that we'll talk about, cleft lip, cleft palate, uh, umbilicil, gastroschisis, we'll touch on those when we get to the chapter. Um, some hernias, and anorectal malformations, again, very uncommon, so we probably won't touch on those. Cleft lip and cleft palate, sometimes you see some extra little defects, like midline defects, heart defects, um, ear malformations. So you may see some other anomalies with uh, cleft lip and cleft palate. They also are at higher risk for ear infections, higher risk for aspiration, and they are hard to feed. So failure to thrive is an issue with them as well. And we'll talk about that when we get to the pictures in the text. Some chronic things, um, reflux, of course. Um, you Under one year, remember we talked about the esophagus isn't fully formed and functional, so it puts you at risk for reflux. Um, lots of teaching to be done with the reflux child, so we'll talk about that. Constipation, probably the most common cause of belly pain, constipation. Um, parents will bring the child in and say, oh, you know, they have an appendicitis, they are having belly pain. When's the last time they had a bowel movement? Oh, it was two days ago or four days ago but they can still be constipated. So um, have an x-ray, sure enough, full of stool. So Hirschsprung's disease. Um, Hirschsprung's disease is a nervous system related you know, um, issue. It's where the lower part of the colon doesn't have the motility, doesn't have the, a, the it's aganglionic. So it doesn't move the stool through like it should in one section. Um, so you end up, you present with chronic constipation. Short bowel syndrome can be a result of a lot of different things, uh, mainly necrotizing intercolitis, or well, I say mainly, but one of the causes can be that um, where they actually have to take out part of the bowel, um, messes with absorption. Um, usually these, these kids end up on TPN, uh, which messes with the liver, so that can be a chronic big disorder to manage. Inflammatory bowel, celiac disease, those are both, um, well, celiac disease is probably a little bit more common now because we have the tools and method to identify it, and we know what it is, we know what we're looking for. <clears throat> so celiac disease is, you're seeing it more and more. Um, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or um, ulcerative colitis, 
those are big disorders to manage as well. A lot of times surgery is involved, ostomies are involved, chronic immunosuppressants, um, failure to thrive, feeding problems. You'll see those for a variety of reasons. Failure to thrive, it can be either organic or inorganic. Um, organic failure to thrive is something that the body does to, you know, either malabsorb malabsorption or, um, like within a, with a child with cystic fibrosis, the the non-production of those pancreatic enzymes. So those can be organic things. Inorganic can be things like knowledge deficit, uh, mom's mixing the formula wrong, uh, abuse. Those are all inorganic failure to thrive issues. All right, here's just some common causes of constipation by age. Um, with the toddler age, you're going to see like holding stool. And then with anal fissures, that's very interesting because they get constipated and then they tear. You know, they may have a little anal fissure because they were constipated. And so that makes them hold at that age. They think, oh, when I went to the bathroom, that hurt, so I'm going to hold it, which makes them more constipated. So this can be like a chronic cycle, that anal fissure thing. Um, this chap, this um, table's in the book as well. Some liver issues, or hepatobiliary, I'm sorry, not just, not just the liver. Pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is very painful. Um, with pancreatitis, you make the patient NPO because total gut rest is what you need. They test for pancreatitis by looking at amylase and lipase. Um, gallbladder disease, not too common in kids, but we have seen it. Jaundice, multiple reasons why we have jaundice. Um, biliary atresia is one. The highest bilirubin I've ever seen um, was a bilirubin of 51 in a, I think it was a four-day-old that came into the hospital for breathing trouble. Um, this child had biliary atresia. They were already had the, when you assess, and when you're reading in the chapter about um, assessing for jaundice, you um, talk about icterus and kernicterus, and they had the disconjugate gaze. Um, this child was sick and was the color of, oh, I don't know, I mean, very golden. Um, so, they, jaundice can vary in degrees of um, severity. Um, hepatitis, don't really see it in kids a lot. Cirrhosis and portal hypertension. I'm going to leave those last three to your um, critical care course, so we won't touch on those in kids. All right, Crohn's and ulcers, ulcerative colitis. Again, these are the inflammatory things going on. You'll see a lot of cramping. You'll see some maybe some blood in the stool, weight loss, more so with Crohn's than ulcerative colitis. And um, there's one, they're very similar, okay, but there's one hallmark in that ulcerative colitis is usually the total colon, okay, everything is involved. Um, with Crohn's, it's more sectional, so you'll see a little section here, you'll see a little section here, and it's deeper. Ulcer, ulcerative colitis is kind of the top layer. Um, with Crohn's, you see that deeper that deeper lesion in the colon. Um, with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, sometimes you end up with an ostomy, and these are different places for an ostomy, and the only different, well, they are very different, but colonoscopy, colostomy, <laughs> ileostomy, displacement. This is in the ileum over here on the, on your right. On the left, that's in the colon, so that's just the difference there. The stool looks totally different too when it comes out. It's more liquidy in the ileostomy. And here's one on a baby. That is an awful big um, ostomy bag for that little baby. Um, Omphalocele and gastroschisis, again, fairly similar, but Omphalocele has a membrane covering the intestinal organs that are born on the are that are on the outside when the baby's born and that's what an emphalocele is it's usually a thumbilicus the internal organs are on the outside but they have a, a sac around them gastroschisis they don't um, so the main goals and interventions these are important to know um, the main one being keep that content moist okay 
we don't want to um, let it dry out. It's kind of like a mala meninges seal. All right, and of course, some psychosocial issues, especially with your chronic GI kids. Um, a lot of times, this is a we're in the hospital a lot situation. Um, parents have guilt issues. You know, they have to work. Um, so th this is just another a chronic. There are lots of chronic GI illnesses that parents um, have to deal with. Teaching is so important. Um, so make sure you do, especially with a new diagnosis, you know, teaching um, how to take care of the ostomy, just lots and lots of teaching. And with the more acute things like gastro, um, lots of teaching there as well. You have to teach hydration. You have to teach what to look for if your child's dehydrated. Um, you know, when's the time to bring them into the hospital, etc. So lots of teaching there, which we'll talk about. All right, so that's the end of the PowerPoint. We're going to come over here to our text. All right. I had the worst mouse ever. All right, this just talks about some variations like we talked about. Um, one of the ones I want you to remember is the esophagus. And so that kind of can lead them to having reflux a little more often. Okay. Um, body fluid balance, I highlighted it here. Remember, they have a greater, or a greater amount of body water than adults, and they require more fluid. That, you know, the, the formula that we use, 150-20, that kind of accounts for that. Okay. For the first 10 kilos, they get more. Um, after they're a big person, they get less per kilo, so that it makes sense. Fever does increase your fluid loss, so remember that. If you have a febrile child, you need to bump up that, um, that fluid intake. All right, pay special attention to the health, the assessment here, because it talks about health history, things that you might ask about, food allergies, um, all important things, getting a good history um, is a big part of figuring out what's going on with the patient. That's an obvious statement, and I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, dig, it has, it has some good ideas of things to ask um, to maybe pick out something that's not so common. All right, I hate it that they put this table right in the middle of this assessment, but we're going to skip the table for a second. Um, physical examination, remember that you auscultate before you palpate, okay? And it does have that, okay? Reserve palpation for the last in the sequence, okay? All right, now let's go back up to the table. And um, some common meds, we talked about um, H2 blockers, we talked about probiotics, um, laxatives and stool softeners, we do use stool softeners. We try to stay away from laxatives. Okay. Um, let's see if there's any more that we should touch on there. Talked about ultrasound. Ultrasound, you're looking for appendicitis, uh, hopefully not pregnancy in a pediatric patient, but it could happen. It has happened. And there's a KUB looking for constipation. That's the most common one you'll see. And then you'll see... Um, You'll see electrolytes drawn a lot if we're looking for dehydration. Um, there's your hemocult. We talked about that. Just looking for blood. And I think that that. Oh, stool culture. Um, if you're looking for a bacterial or a viral cause for your or bacteria, it depends on the kind of culture you do. If you do a PCR, looking for viral things, you can find a viral diary as well. So again, just depends on what you're looking for. Oven parasites, you might see a stool for ONP. That's what they call that. Um, again, looking for a cause of chronic diarrhea. Okay, we talked about that. How to collect a stool specimen, and you probably will be um, at one point in your life collecting stool specimens. Now this is a good picture of a good stoma. Um, so nice and pink. Um, beefy red, 
um, or ostomy care. There's a section here on ostomy care to use for teaching for your parents. They can probably teach you how to do it. I know you all did that back in foundations, I think. All right, cleft lip and cleft palate. And let's get a little bit deeper in this. Cleft lip and cleft, pa cleft lip and cleft palate. When do they repair? Okay, so cleft lip is usually repaired mm, a couple months old. Um, and then cleft palate is a little bit longer, about six months. And so they repair them. And if they're in combo, they repair them in stages too. Um, the earlier they can do a cleft lip, the better it looks. But they, they mostly don't do it, well, I say they mostly don't do it for cosmetic reasons. Of course they do it for cosmetic reasons, but feeding is an issue. All right, so feeding, increased risk for ear infections, um, those are all issues with cleft lip, cleft palate. Um, a lot of times breastfeeding is better for these kids because it's more moldable to the crevices on their face. That makes sense if you think about that. Um, Feeding position upright is important because you don't want that, that formula getting working its way back behind um, the ear, causing a, an ear infection. All right, there's a picture, and they say that's a cleft lip. I can't really tell if it's cleft palate or not, but um, a gloved finger in the mouth, you may see that in OB. They check for the palate um, integrity. All right, in, in the care plan at the end of the chapter, there um, is some information about cleft lip and cleft palate. These kids have, let me show you the pictures, they have special feeders that um, are very expensive. One of my nursing students, when I was a clinical instructor, threw one away. She thought it was disposable. They're mega expensive. So if you have a child with, I know you're out of clinical already, but with um, cleft lip, cleft palate that has a special feeder, don't throw it away. Um, bonding sometimes is an issue because parents, well, you can imagine, um, you know, if you have a, a child with a cleft lip or cleft palate, it can be kind of a shock. So really promoting that bonding is very important. All right, esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, esophageal atresia is just what it sounds like, atresia of the esophagus, okay? It may be total. Um, TEF, or tracheoesophageal fistula, this will present shortly after birth, okay? Um, here are the assessment findings you're going to see, all right? Um, and the fistula is just an open, abnormal opening between two between the trachea and the esophagus, okay? And you can only imagine what happens if they are taking formula and it goes into the, the trachea, then you see the coughing, you see the choking, you see the frothy sputum. Um, and at that point, if you see that, this kid is NPO, okay? We do not want to risk aspiration if we see that. So if you're in the nursery or if you're in OB and you're in the nursery and taking care of newborns, Make sure that you're aware of this. This will probably help you more in OB than it will in PD. All right, and here's your nursing, or your nursing interventions for um, pre-op if you notice or if you have a child diagnosed with a TEF, tracheoesophageal fistula. Okay, and um, here's some pictures of um, phallocele and gastroschisis. Gastroschisis used to be um, pretty much terminal. Okay, the kids that had gastroschisis didn't survive. Um, probably when I was 21, a friend of my mom's had a baby with a gastroschisis and they just, they didn't know what to do with it. So that was 20 years, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but now um, it's, it's totally fixable. So um, phallocele, gastroschisis, the difference is the sac covering them phallocele. Let's read through that section. All right, some anorectal um, malformations. I guess the most common one you're going to see is in perforate anus. Um, these kids present with non-passage of, of stool. They don't pass their meconium. Um, usually they know about it before they don't pass their meconium, but if you have a child that has not past its meconium, then they investigate the whole 
imperforate anus thing. Meckel diverticulum, very uncommon. We're not going to talk about that. Um, inguinal and umbilical hernias. You'll see a lot of umbilical hernias in, in kids. We don't get excited about these until they, A, aren't reducible, and I'll tell you what that means, and B, lasts longer than a year or so. Um, an umbilical hernia is that bottom picture there, um, and it's basically just a, a non-closure of that muscle, okay? If you notice one of these, and they may be big, okay? If you notice one of these, you just palpate it, and if it reduces, if it just kind of goes back down in there, then don't worry about it. When you can't reduce it, or when it's painful, or when it starts to get red or inflamed, then that's when you worry about it. Okay. The inguinal hernia, again, pretty common. Um, a lot of times those will close up in the first year, but that's kind of what it looks like. Eh, that's not a real good picture, but you'll see just a little bulge in the groin area. Nursing management, well, medical management is surgery if they don't close on their own. All right, some acute GI disorders. Dehydration, gastroenteritis, probably the most common one you're going to see. I want you to make sure that you know this section, okay? Dehydration is, is pretty common. We try to um, do oral rehydration if we can. Again, avoiding the IV if, if at all possible, but if we can't, then they end up with IV fluids. There is your um, comparison chart for mild, moderate, and severe dehydration, okay? With mild dehydration, you get a little bit of, um, you know, I haven't, my baby hasn't peed in 10 hours or hasn't had a wet diaper, so just a little bit of, of not normalness, okay? Moderate, you get a little listless, your fontanelle starts to sink in a bit, um, maybe dry lips. Um, urine output is starting to get pretty, pretty um, decreased. Delayed cap refill, and then severe, they're out, okay? Um, bradycardia is a sign of severe dehydration. Um, tenting, severe dehydration. Hypotension, severe dehydration, okay? Babies are pretty resilient until the end, and then they... Um, they go down pretty quick, so those are all late signs. Um, here's your fluid. Oh, look! Here's your here's your um, formula, which you will need to know on the exam, because you will have a fluid maintenance um, question. And please remember to convert to kilograms. Causing a vomiting, um, you can have structural obstructive causes for vomiting if you um, are constipated. You can have vomiting from that, or you can have infectious. Most of the time, it's a viral issue. Um, you can have vomiting with strep. You can have vomiting with an ear infection. You can have vomiting with meningitis, with a migraine. Um, so lots of different things can cause vomiting. Brain tumors, food poisoning. Um, so there's lots to investigate if you have a child that presents with just vomiting. Usually with vomiting, you have diarrhea to go along with it. And one of the big questions to ask is, what came first, the vomiting or the diarrhea? If they say the vomiting and then the diarrhea, that makes perfect sense. Because if your body ingests, because remember I said the mouth is a portal for infection. If you ingest some sort of weird um, pathogen, then your stomach's going to try to get rid of it first. If it makes it through the intestine, then the other end's going to try to get rid of it. So that's the body's way of dealing with that. Um, lots of different causes. It can be viral. Um, it can be bacterial. Um, it can be parasites. So um, good history taking is important. It can be food intolerances, milk, soy, biggies. Okay. Um, so I do want you to know this, this section as well. Vomiting, diarrhea. Very, very, very common in kids. Thrush is something else that you'll see a lot with mainly infants, but if you has, have an asthmatic, asthmatic, um, and they have you know chronic steroid inhaler therapy, 
then they could have thrush as well. So thrush is fungal. It's treated with nice statin. Um, a lot of times you'll have a diaper rash to go along with it. So um, nice statin is four times a day. You give it after feeds. Um, you put it in the in the cheeks, like half of it, half of the dose goes in one cheek, half of the dose goes in the other cheek, because you want it to stay there in the mouth. So you don't give nystatin and then feed. That's a teaching point. Um, you feed and then give nystatin. Okay, oral lesions. Okay, so viral, viral um, illnesses are usually what you see that cause oral, oral um, lesions. Herpangina is caused by the Coxsackie virus. Um, lots of different viruses. There's probably 16 or 20 viruses that cause some sort of infection or some sort of ulcer in your mouth. Um, hand, foot, and mouth disease. Um, herpangina is probably the most common that you'll see. Big ulcerative painful lesions. These kids present with big O fevers, drooling, they won't eat. Two important teaching points, pain control and hydration. Okay, pain control and hydration. Remember that. All right, pyloric stenosis. Pyloric stenosis, it says it presents between weeks three and six, and that's about right. About week four, one month old's pretty common not pretty common, that's that's the age that you'll see most commonly. Um, mostly in males, firstborn males. Um, what happens is that sphincter there just kind of um, closes up and probably not totally closes up, but it's, it's stenosed. Um, you'll see vomiting, like across the room vomiting, um, over and over vomiting, nothing goes down, okay? These kids are at high risk for dehydration because they're not getting any liquid, any fluid. They're a month old. Um, they eat every two hours. So um, they'll present to the emergency room with vomiting, and it is a surgical, it requires surgical intervention. So they go in and they um, basically open up that muscle and they relieve that obstruction. So these kids get IV hydration. They get to go to the OR. Um, and then you make sure that when you're assessing them, you're assessing their hydration status. You assess their fontanelles. You assess their vital signs. All right, into susception, we talked about, and there's a great picture of the telescoping thing going on. Okay, uh, we talked about how they present. They present um, intermittent, crampy abdominal pain. It's a perfect way of putting it. Um, current jelly stools. Um, you. A lot of times this can be reduced by um, going to the, the procedures lab and doing like a barium enema or gastrographin enema that opens it up. A lot of times they have to go to surgery. Um, one of the sickest kids that I've ever had had an insusception. We took him to the intervention lab to try to reduce it. Um, he coded in the intervention lab uh, and ended up in the ICU for a long, long time with half of his intestine missing, um, so it can be a bad situation. Uh, malrotation and bobulus, just kind of know what it is, just for your own knowledge, just what it sounds like, malrotation where the intestine kind of sp spins around on itself. You won't be tested on any of that. Appendicitis. Appendicitis, right lower quadrant pain, it's an inflammation of the appendix. Um, Pain is usually there unless it's ruptured. If it ruptures, then their pain kind of goes away for a little bit. Um, so if you have a child that presents to the emergency department or presents to your office or presents to you with right lower quadrant pain, and then they say, oh, I'm fine now, um, be leery, okay? Because probably, well, probably what happened is their appendix might have ruptured. Um, if the appendix ruptured, then that puts them at risk for peritonitis. So fever afterwards, sometimes fever before, sometimes nausea, vomiting. Um, this is what you're going to see in an in a appendicitis child. Um, it's really hard to tell the difference between like a, an appendicitis and a constipation. 
um, that's why anybody that presents with any, you know, close to, close to symptoms of an appendicitis, they usually will get an ultrasound. All right, and the intervention for that is surgical. They go in and take out the appendix. All righty. Reflux, lots of teaching involved in reflux. Um, reflux is pretty common in kids. Usually resolves about a year um, when that esophagus finally wakes up and grows up. Um, feeding is a big one with this. A, a lot of most of the time we try to do it non non medication interventions. So burp them frequently, upright thirty minutes after feeds, um, small frequent feeds. Those are all teaching points. For reflux babies. Occasionally we'll have to put them on some, um, I think they use, I don't know what they use now, uh, they used to use like Reglan and um, something for motility. Um, Zantac, they used to use Zantac a lot. Um, I think they've moved on to even like protonics with kids. So um, one of those blockers, <coughs> excuse me, um, good health history is really important. Kids with reflux are more risk for aspiration, so make sure that you do a good respiratory assessment um, on your kids with, um, re with reflux. Sometimes when they present as, we used to call them um, life-threatening, acute life-threatening episodes, A-L-T-E, um, what they would be doing would be aspirating. So they, parents didn't know they had reflux and they quote unquote quit breathing for 20 seconds or 30 seconds, which is considered apnea. Um, and then they were, they were refluxing. So that, that's how we found their reflux. So a lot of times that's the presentation. They do have a um, prevalence for ear infections as well. All right, so make sure that you read through this, this whole section as well. Peptic ulcer disease, you usually don't see that in kids, um, so we're not going to touch on that. Constipation, however, you do see a lot of constipation in kids. Um, there again is that table. Maybe important to know, kind of, if you have a two-year-old, this could be causing our constipation, or if you have an adolescent, this could be causing our constipation. How do you manage it? Dietary. We try dietary uh, interventions first, uh, increased fluid, increased fruits and vegetables, um, stool softeners can be used, enemas can be used. Um, there's some information on Hirschsprung's disease. Again, know what these disease processes present with, know what you're going to do about them, and know what you're going to teach the parents. Short bowel. Okay, we talked about short bowel. It does affect absorption. Um, it can put them at risk for infection because a lot of times they'll end up with a central line for their TPN because they can't absorb oral um, nutrition. They have to get parenteral nutrition. nutrition. Um, here's your inflammatory bowel um, situation. Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. This chart is fabulous, okay? It, it compares Crohn's and ulcer, ulcerative colitis, and we talked about one of the differences. Here's the area of bowel affected, okay? Usually ulcerative colitis, total colon, okay? Um, Crohn's can be anywhere in the ileum, uh, but segmental, okay? So pay attention to that chart. Nursing management, here's some meds that they use. They use a lot of, like, um, immunosuppressive meds, methotrexate, cyclosporin, um, so big time meds used with um, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Celiac, I want you to know the diet for celiac. I want you to know how these kids present for celiac um, because it's becoming more and more common. There's your gluten-free diet, really important. Not just to me, but for HESI and NCLEX, there's lots of diet questions, so make sure you know your diet. All right. 
pancreatitis, we talked a little bit about pancreatitis. Gut rest is what you're going to, this, that's the treatment for this. Um, kids are on IV fluids. If they're on, if they have pancreatitis for a long time, they can be put on TPN. Um, but you just have to let your pancreas rest. And the only way to do that is to not introduce any food into it, into the GI system. Okay, amylase and lipase are elevated in pancreatitis. Again, gallbladder, don't see it very often. We talked a little bit about biliary atresia. Hepatitis, I'm going to leave to your adult um, course. Cirrhosis, portal hypertension, same thing. Liver transplant. Um, if you have a child with short bowel syndrome, you may see a liver transplant there. Uh, or if they have some chronic hepatobiliary biliary <laughs> disease or disorder. Um, the liver transplants are more typically seen in adults. Here's your care plan. You know I like the care plans, so pay attention to your care plan. And then the key concepts at the end. So that's all I've got. I know that this one was long, but um, lots of information to cover. Y'all have a good day.